Uh, having grown up in the city of Detroit, I was uh, a teenager at the time of the uh, racial conflicts in 1943. Remember it vividly. Uh, came downtown during the first day of that clash. It was a time when the automobile factories were looking for workers, and as a result, a great number of African Americans came north and were working side by side with white Southerners and white Northerners. The North was not, uh, not without its, uh, its share of, uh, of, of racial attitudes, bad racial attitudes. Somebody lit a spark that, that set off a terrible conflict in the city that lasted for a few days. National Guard came in. There were 40-some people, I think, or 30-some people who were killed, mostly African Americans. So I was, I had that experience as a very young man. There was a good bit of rampant anti-Semitism through the 40s, for sure. Not that it's it disappeared by now or in the 60s. But I was, uh, I think I was touched by all of that in some way, and I couldn't imagine not wanting to be a part of movements uh, that I saw other people uh, involved in and, and wanting to be a, a part of it. It was part of who I was by that time. I had come from Montgomery where I had worked in the SNCC office for a few days as a, as a gopher because there was a lot of things to do and people came in and volunteered. And one evening, uh, they called on me to carry out a special assignment. I had rented a car at the airport when I flew in from Detroit to Montgomery. And having rented it there, it had an Alabama license plate on it, so it was not one of them them foreign intruders that was coming down to make trouble, you know. And I looked reasonably respectable. So they said, would you take your car? Because there had been a demonstration earlier in the day in Montgomery and a lot of arrests and so on. And just drive it, drive it, drive it around the Capitol. It was in the evening. And if there's any problem at all, uh, here's a telephone number and you call and ask for John Doe. Well, I don't know who I would be calling if something came up, but I had the phone number and I had his name. And I went out that night by myself and for about two hours just drove around the Capitol. I felt like I was in a foreign country and in enemy territory, uh, imagining things that probably weren't there, but there had been enough trouble that it was uh, of some concern to me. I had no reason to call that telephone number and I came back and I reported that I hadn't seen anything significant. It was only days later that I found out that this John Doe I was supposed to call was John Doar, who was the federal representative from the Justice Department who had been assigned to be down in Montgomery and, and later in Selma during the march. Amongst those who were there, who had come in for the purpose of participating, uh, there was a, a spirit of comradeship uh, similar to what I had seen in Detroit during the 1963 march. There was also something that had been absent in Detroit, and that was a, uh, a lineup on both sides of the march as we went through Selma to the bridge and continued, a lineup of the people who lived in the area who were not at all happy with us and let us know about it in ways uh, which I could not repeat here. That changed the, the atmosphere uh, from what had been in Detroit where nobody had uh, negative views that were expressed that, that I ever saw. One particular thing I recall outside of the excitement of seeing the front line of that march with uh, Dr. King and uh, David Abernathy and Walter Ruther and uh, uh, Rabbi Abraham Heschel, uh, who were in that front line. It was just, it was just absolutely thrilling to, to see that. So at the end of the first day, it got very chilly and got dark, and we assembled in a, uh, 
a kind of a muddy, big parking lot while arrangements had been made to bring in dozens, maybe even more than dozens of big buses to take people back to Selma to do whatever they were going to do. In one little corner of that parking lot, it was filled with, with paper from sandwiches and coffee cups and things like that. It's not surprising. I mean, people had to put things somewhere, and they were gathered there, cold and uncomfortable and tired because it was the end of hours of walking. There was one gentleman standing in the corner quietly, picking stuff up. Nobody else was around him. And I went over there, and I kind of admired what he was doing, and I picked up a couple of things. He's, he stayed with it. I don't think I did. You know who that, that fellow was? Dick Gregory. I, as I say, I recognize him because I had seen him on television, and I don't think I said more to him than hello, uh, but I've never forgotten that. I've carried that admiration for him, uh, knowing that, that one little thing. It was a wonderful experience for me. I'm very glad that I was able to be there 